Okay, so on the show today, Jason Diggs. This is a man I've met, I think, once or twice, but we've gone very well with in Amsterdam. I remember hanging out and having a good experience and um, mm-hmm. came to my training there. I've heard good things. Authentic Relating, one of the co-founders of Authentic Relating Training, which is called Art. Uh, just made a new book about conflict equals energy. Is that what it's called, Jason? Did I get that right? Yes. And worked for Ken Wilber at the Integral Institute, I believe, for some years. Am I, am I yeah, being accurate was- again there? Yeah, way back when I was the video producer for the integral community. So I was creating a lot of content for all the different spiritual teachers and absorbing the knowledge that way. What a great, my, my video guy often says that he gets a sort of free lesson every time he videos me. So I could imagine that was a hell of a treat with all those people. Right? You're in Boulder, Colorado, right? Mm, that's right. I am in Moscow in a sort of, if, if podcast listeners go to YouTube, they'll see my sort of oligarch. Airbnb is kind of how I think of it today. And I'm dressed slightly smarter than normal because I've been uh, teaching some executives in, uh, in Moscow for ridiculous money, which is fantastic. Working with the gay community as well, having a nice time in Moscow generally. So um, we're in very different parts of the planet, I'm aware. Boulder and Moscow. I, I can almost feel the difference between the two. It's almost like a polarity. It is, isn't it? They're like off the gang in the year. Uh, we're going to find something in the middle. You're, you're probably what I need or else a, a good dose of Boulder before I, before I get to Moscovite. <coughs> um, excuse me. I hope that's not COVID. There's quite a lot over here. Um, okay. Well, while I cough, could you um, tell me about your story? Tell us about your life, how you got interested in the body and authenticity and all these shenanigans. Yeah, so I was a psychology geek and philosophy nerd for many, many years. I actually moved across the country to work for Ken Wilber. And, and back then in, in 2000, uh, starting in 2003, but the, the following you know, five to seven years, I was working very closely with the Integral Institute and all the different teachers there. And you know, we would get together and just have these far reaching philosophical conversations and how integral theory was going to, you know, uh, propel evolution and, and you know we were a bunch of uh folks in our late 20s trying to change the world with integral theory and slowly i kind of realized actually that's not going to happen <laughs> okay, we're not going to change our, our listeners some of them don't know who kim will be so we've had him on the show yeah. beautiful episode actually i make him cry and um very good episode and he's a you know america's philosopher the theory of everything And there was this integral movement out of Boulder, which was really like, we're going to help everyone evolve. It's going to be the next big thing. Human consciousness is going to go forward. And it was sort of geeky, kind of heady at times was the reputation. And also kind of wonderfully arrogant in a way. Like we're we're these 20 somethings who are going to change the the evolution of human consciousness forever. Yeah. Yeah. Back 15 years ago, when people read books, Ken would write these, you know, 600 page books on integral philosophy and uh, taking all of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy and, and kind of marrying them together and integrating them, created what he calls integral theory. And he's really influenced, uh, you know, transpersonal psychology and psychologists around the world. He's probably the foremost theoretical transpersonal psychologist with his 30 books. And, you know, people like Deepak Chopra count Ken as a teacher. And so I was in the midst of that. And, and uh, what I realized is that we weren't necessarily making any kind of impact on the mainstream society. We, right. were, we were doing good work. We were spreading, you know, the good vibes and, and, and t- attempting to elevate consciousness, which is a noble thing to try to do. Uh, and also, if it's not practical, if it doesn't meet people where they're at, what's the use of it? And so I began to think about this and, and kind of extended my quest to like, what's really relevant for someone who lives in the mid- Midwest of America or who uh, doesn't think like the us. And, you know, integral theory is really good at that. Like, how do we take multiple perspectives and how do we uh, look at these different worldviews and, and see the different values and being able to listen to the values in another? And, you know, as I was learning quite a bit as a video producer. Um, that must have been cool, by the way. I'm just, I'm kind of curious, like, what was that like to sit behind the camera? Because they had everyone on, because Ken was, like, respected by everyone. He knew everyone. It's like, it just seemed like you must have been sitting in a room with some very cool people. Oh, it was so fun. It was so fun. You know, I got to have breakfast with Deepak Chopra and a few other people when he was the keynote speaker of one of our conferences and got to, uh, you, you know, just listen and learn from the feet, you know, listen at the feet of the masters and and learn so, so much. Uh, And 
at that time in my life, I was very much absorbing, absorbing knowledge, reading a lot of books. And eventually I was like, okay, now uh, when I approached my late thirties, I was like, I, I actually want to start engaging and giving back more. And that's when I found circling and authentic relating. And it, and it was a modality that really um, spoke to my heart. Um, well, actually, I'll rewind a few years. So there was a, a, a time when I realized I'm actually deeply cut off from my body, that all of this, um, you know, spiritual work, whether it's meditation or uh, integral theory, it's actually not, I'm developing slowly, incrementally, I'm expanding my awareness. Uh, but when it came to a situation like getting into a conflict with, you know, one of my clients, I behaved like, a, you know, a teenager throwing a, a, a hissy fit. You know, I was just like not skillful at all in communication um, in those kinds of situations. Uh, and around that time, I started uh, a dance practice. So I was uh, very deeply into five rhythms dance. And, um, you know, a year or two later, starting contact improv. And that really was the beginning of my embodiment path. And it slowly really started to work on me and, and, and help me be more self-aware. Right, right. Sometimes the integral world, I think, has been rightly criticized from the embodiment world as being a little light on the body. You know, there's, <laughs> Ken Wilber was lifting weights and it was like fitness, but it, uh, not so much embodiment. That had been sort of thrown out a little bit. And, um, you know, not with some exceptions, you know, some cool people out there. Um, Rob McNamara, for example, friend of mine. And um, th this idea of uh, it needed a practice. And it seemed like circling, authentic relating, we should go right back to what that is for listeners as well. But it sure. seemed like that started to emerge as the practice of this kind of, you know, group of nerds, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was very much needed. You know, we needed a way to... Uh, really chart back to the body, back to the here and now. So authentic relating is an embodied practice. And what I mean by that is it's actually about uh, deciphering all of what's happening underneath the surface. You know, it's about putting our awareness in and determining what our needs and, and wants and desires are and being able to communicate them in a, with other people in a way that's effective. And uh, circling, you know, going deep into the present moment in this way that's very open-ended it's a good time it's a great ride you know you'll get seen and heard and felt and if you do it half a dozen times you might have some good experiences but if you do it hundreds of times or hundreds of hours and treat it like a practice um, i believe it directly increases people's emotional awareness their social awareness and so that's what we really began to see as leaders of the circling and authentic relating movement is people who treat it like a practice and, and did it frequently over the course of months, started growing like crazy in their ability to um, actually have boundaries, to communicate what they needed, their relationships improved, you know, people who couldn't get a date uh, before they started practicing. After a couple months of practicing, they could get a date. I was one of those. Like my, my um, experience of, of romance and dating improved very quickly and dramatically and, uh, you know, uh, years later, now I'm happily partnered and I, and I know myself as, as a being um, of passion and romance and, and, and I, I feel very comfortable with my sexuality. Whereas when I started the practice, I didn't, you know. Okay, so it gets you laid. You got my attention. So um, no, no, I've, I've definitely seen this pattern of people who are like into circling. Uh, again, let's go back to right the nuts and bolts of it in a minute. Who the people who are really into it, I mean, it was really like, like I hit it off with you pretty quickly. John in, in Amsterdam, for example, is a good friend of mine. We had on the show. Mauritia, I would easily marry just any day of the week if I was uh, happy to be free. You know, like there's some, some people I know who are really into it, who I really just love. I love being around them. And they, they seem to have a way of connecting deeply, of um, there's an ease to their communication. There's a bullshit freeness. You know, I like working with them. You know, John over in Mauritia, I've done work with business work. And then people who are a little bit into it and knobheads who fucking annoy me. And I, I go, how does that happen? Like, what, what's going on there that the people who are a bit into it are annoying, but the people who are a lot into it are really cool? Like, I'm kind of confused by that. Yeah, I could speculate. I could say my, well, I think what happens for people is when they are seen and heard and felt in a very, very deep way that's healing for them, um, you know, because relational trauma is very common and 
we like to say that you know a, a trauma that happens in relationship needs to be healed in relationship, right? So I think people um, are on a very deep healing journey, but then they start to expect other people to to be like them. Like you know, when someone's really deeply into something, they tend to make it a dogma. It's like, oh, if you're not no. doing the communication pattern that allows me to be seen felt and heard that means that you're somehow not in touch with yourself or you know and so there's uh, whenever we take something and and try to expect the rest of the world to be into the same things that we are uh, we can be knobheads as as you say <laughs> so I think I that's think thing in NVC and other things it's not I don't think this is unique to this practice kind of any communication price listen we better take a step back so if someone goes to authentic relating is there going to be lots of deep eye gazing and talking about our feelings you know like what, what's the deal here how does it work like nuts and bolts sure so our international authentic relating training is the company that i co-founded co about three years ago and we we looked at exactly what you said and we it's like this is a problem this is something that's uh, just appealing to personal growth junkies people who have already drunk the kool-aid you know people are going into it very deeply and they're just creating another club around circling and around these practices. Like how do we make it relevant for the rest of uh, society? And so we created a two day training called the art of being human. And it, it really is, a, it's like a course that's designed for humans. Our target market is everyone. And you know, I've had a 15 year old girl in my course with her father um, in Amsterdam. Uh, this mother brought her 16 and 18 year old sons to the course. So we've really translated a lot of these practices. There's, there's not a lot of eye, eye gazing. Um, it's, it's much more designed for um, everyone. And then we also started a nonprofit um, that, one second, that is doing this same exact course in the prisons of Colorado. So we've put, for uh, 400 inmates through the art of being human course. And we have stacks of letters and, you know, people uh, beginning to have real authentic uh, conversations around race um, and the, the divide between Hispanics and, and blacks and, and whites inside the prisons of, of Colorado. And unfortunately that work is all on hold because of COVID. Uh, okay. Okay. And, and what you, authenticity? So this is a big buzzword. You know, everyone's authentic. I, you know, my joke's always that authenticity is like wild sex. If you think you're having it, you're not like, <laughs> so, so it's, so it's, you know, like I never met anyone that talked about authenticity who was authentic. So like, like what's, what's the obsession with the A word? What's going on with that? Yeah, for me, authenticity is the willingness to reveal the next layer, right? It's not sharing everything, but it's sharing the thing that you would normally sweep underneath the rug. In, okay. like, in, social, in social dynamics, if there's this thing like, oh, I, would, I just have the impulse to sweep that underneath the rug and kind of politely excuse myself from conversation. Like authenticity is just the willing to bring that, um, you know, even it, with someone you're working for, right? It's the ability to stand up for your perspective, even if there's a power dynamic and that person is above you in the hierarchy. And, and so it takes will, it takes courage, but it also lives in polarity with relating. That's why it's called authentic relating. We can't just, you know, dump our truth on someone. You suck. Um, yeah. Yeah. And what about when it's just not strategic, right? Because the reason most people aren't authentic is that I'm, I'm having dinner with someone last night and I looked across the table and she just had the most beautiful breasts I'd ever seen. Just ridiculously beautiful. And in that moment, it just pops into my head, right? Is it authentic to just sort of blurt out, oh my God, your chest was sent from heaven? Like, like, like or is that just crude and unpleasant? It's going to ruin both our evening. Well, what was the result? Did you say it? I said an hour later. We, yeah, exactly. We... It's timing. It's like if you... <laughs> <laughs> By that point, it was appropriate. If, but it's... if she's batting her eyes at you and it's like, you know, hour three, four of the date, then you can say it. If you say it up front, it's just, it's just like crash and burn, right? But I mean, I'm, I'm making a joke here. It's a real example, actually, but it's making a joke that it's, there's this, there's like that most people, and I think I don't do this enough. Like I get in a lot of trouble because I'm not particularly strategic 
you know, I have poor impulse control. It's another ADHD thing, apparently. I've been reading about this. I'm like, oh, I've got all that. And it, it's, that means the stuff just comes out of my mouth and then I've said it and it's too late and I can't unsay it. It's like, sometimes I want to say, can I unsay that? And you can't. So um, like, like, like it, where there's like impulse control and I guess tax timing and also just considering impact. I don't hold myself responsible for others, but I do, I am interested in their feelings. I say, I'm not responsible, I am interested. That's my kind of take on it. Yeah. Like, like, and sometimes I just screw myself over. It's not strategic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of people out there, the willing to be truthful and honest um, as a practice is extremely helpful. You know, bringing transparency in as uh, a value in our relationships. Because actually the human nervous system, when we're scared or when we're ashamed, it's just the natural thing is that to hide things, right? Have you ever met a child who didn't lie? It just yeah, doesn't exist. Yeah, they're huge, right? huge, huge lies. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Because they feel shame in their nervous system and they immediately have to deal with that emotional energy somehow. And so they try to escape the blame. And, and we were all children one day and all of those patterns are still living in our bodies. And other people, maybe you're in this category, Mark. 10% of us who have big mouths. Come on, yeah, that's 90% of people are cowards. 10% of us have big mouths. So what do we need? What do we need? It's, it's practice empathizing with others and practicing considering impact and how your, um, your power and your authority in the world impacts. You know, you, you walk around like a 800 pound gorilla. And so understanding uh, power dynamics and, and how you affect people when you walk into a room um, is, is, a, is might be a good practice for you. I don't, I don't yeah, know how it's going so far. It's now I'm like the Mr. Embodiment Conference with the book and it's all changing and all of a sudden people are getting freaked out by shit they used to find funny. So um, yeah, yeah, different things change over time, certainly in terms of in, I'm learning my impact is changing based on not necessarily my own in, in a world, but in terms of the, you know, how I'm perceived, for example. Um, you know, someone said, Hey, you're the head of a conference now. You're not just a you know, loud mouth. You know, I was like, Okay, that, that is different. That is different. Okay, so we've got this. The, you know, what's your take on responsibility then, in terms of like, you know, people you make me angry or I feel upset when you say that? Like, what's your take on that whole thing? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the most important principles and practices of authentic relating is called own your experience. This comes from nonviolent communication. Uh, nonviolent communication was the cutting edge in uh, communication practice 35 years ago. Uh, it's, th there's a problem with nonviolent communication. Number one, it's the name is nonviolent. <laughs> and and tr the truth is, is like, if you're trying to push away violence, you're actually in the shadow. Anyway, that's, that's a little more complicated, but owning your experience, right, essentially means taking more responsibility. So the way I like to say it, it's, it's not about changing your language. It's not about making your language pro, uh, patterns so that they don't ruffle any feathers and are, is never violent. And it's like, that's trying to sanitize our communication. It can, I can still say come, right, Jason? I can still say come. That's what you're saying. Come still. Yes. Great. Yeah. That's important. I want to get that on the menu. Okay, good. So we're not sanitizing the language. What are we doing? Uh, it, the phrase that I use as the key to this practice is be the emotional maturity you want to see in the world. So essentially it's about taking responsibility for what your needs and wants and values are and bringing more of that into the world. And so sometimes that's like, Oh, I need to uh, approach a conflict while owning my side or owning my part in things and I need to not, you know, I need to not be blaming in the, in my language. And other times it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take all of these emotions that I'm having that um, in truth have me being a whiny um, C word, whatever you want to say. I'm not going to say what oh, we got a C word. Now we got an N word. We got a C word. We got a B word. It's just going to be a dictionary full of letters in the beginning. So if my internal thoughts are, um, acting like a whiny bitch. Yes. Like, auth authenticity doesn't mean that I whine or like complain or expect other people to take that away. It actually means I'm going to set that on the shelf and take care of that later with, you know, either my therapist or a bitch session with my best friend. And right now I'm going to be the, be solution oriented and actually come from a place that's like, I know what I want to have happen in this situation. And my communication reflects that. 
Right, right. I'm just trying to think like in terms of conflict then, it seems to be one of your specialist subjects, you know, owning your own side of things like, hey, you know, maybe I'm bringing my own shit to this. And I think my colleagues, we're all pretty good at that. Like we can go, you know what, I'm, I'm something, I've got a side of this, you know, it's, I'm, it's probably not one-sided, occasionally it is. And then what else? We go, yeah, let's be solution focused. Let's not blame each other. You know, like actually, how can we move forward? Like that's another thing I think like, you know, me and Daniela have a row. We're pretty good at that kind of stuff. Like what, what else for conflict? What are some, some good ones for, you know, most people out there have conflict, right? You know, normally with the people they love most as well. Yeah. So the book has uh, two different processes. It's uh, one is called emotional Aikido and one is called emotional alchemy and each have five steps and, and each is a principle. So one of them is consent. So if I'm really pissed off at you and I just start yelling in your face, that's not skillful, right? But if I ask, hey, Mark, I'm really pissed off. Can I let some rage out? Can I, can yeah, yeah, I, had a girlfriend, I express like, this? Yeah, and I, I might not be able to. Yeah, exactly. I might not yeah, be able yeah, to okay, fully own check. my experience. Oh. Yeah. And so if I ask permission to be messy with you. Consent. Consent. So just getting consent for. Um, Can for I give you some someone feedback, feedback right? for instance? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay if I tell you how this lands on me? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Important one. Super, super into that. Cool. What else? What else we got for conflict? Well, the whole um, authentic relating curriculum, uh, you know, it's a, a set of tools and practices for communication, connection. Uh, we talk a lot about setting context and setting context is leadership 101, right? And so I go detail into this uh, an entire chapter of the book is dedicated to setting context because it's really the key to preventing conflict before it begins and uh, setting uh, the right parameters for us to be able to work through things. It, the, the last few chapters of the book are really about transmuting emotional energy uh, into clarity, teamwork, um, or a palpable feeling of connection, like, oh, we're, we're in this together, right? Um, and that's why the book is called Conflict Equals Energy. The, the premise is that the universe will give us these kind of perfect situations that allow us to um, really grow in our emotional awareness. And, and, uh, and we fail a lot. I, I know I fail at conflict situations. And that's part that's of the growth. That's a good point, Jason. Like a lot of us, myself included, have done personal growth work. We've done the MVC or the circle. Whatever. And then and I find myself, and I think I'm not the only one, just just in rubbish conflict and just not doing that well. Do you know what I mean? Like really not, I'm going, oh, I'm blaming, I've raised my voice, I'm not listening well. You know, a bit of centering I find helps, a bit of state regulation. We're only as good as our state as opposed to uh, the book we've read, you know? But like, like any, I mean, other than sort of cut ourselves some slack, like any, anything on like when we find ourselves just operating so much lower than we know we could. Mm. Yeah, the very first tool in the book. So the book has uh, 30 tools. Uh, it's can we slow down, which is actually a request uh, for both of us to slow down. And it, it has a little bit of like, both of us might need this is the kind of subtext of the question. So it has a little bit of teamwork building, like, oh, can we slow down? And our nervous systems are capable of processing a lot of conflict, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, if we're actually in resonance, if we're, you know, um, keep, there's a principle called conflict or um, connection over content. So if we're keeping the relationship that you and I have together um, in mind as we're doing everything else, we can process a lot of emotional energy. And if we, and the first thing to go is like, oh, this person has been in my life for 10 years. Oh, they're a close friend. Oh, they're, you know, an important colleague. That stuff kind of goes out the window when we That's get good triggered. That's saying, right? Like, hey, we love each other. We're a great couple and we're gonna work on some stuff today. Or well, hey, me and you, we get on well, I really value you as an employee. You know, you do a great job. And there's this one thing that isn't quite as I like. Exactly. Right. So that, that kind of keeping that relationship in mind in the context is pretty key. It yeah? just creates psychological safety, which allows us to lean into what's happening uh, and be authentic with each other instead of 
sweep it in underneath the carpet because I'm scared if I speak up, I might get fired, right? Yeah, that's yeah, interesting in Russia, it's a really low trust culture. So it's very difficult to be authentic here because it's just a lot of fear and like almost to the point of paranoia in the kind of culture in terms of people actually, you know, because Stalin kill you, right? Like in terms of, you don't speak what you think in, in that environment. 